Is in prayer, please. Okay. All right. Father, we want to thank you for being uh, with us today. Uh, we're thankful that we've been having this Family Life series for a few months now. And we've been talking about how to love the one that you love, how to love the one that you love forever. We have done two sessions already. And uh, we pray that this final session will be a beautiful, beautiful one. How to keep the one you love loving you forever. You realize that um, marriage relationships are in challenges, are very challenged today. But you have given us principles that will help us uh, to extend our, our, our relationships. Bless the panel today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And don't forget, please link the link and invite your friends, your co-workers, your family members, your children to join us. So link the link. We have 24 souls on here. Let us triple it. So by the time we start our new session, a lot of people will be here to be blessed. So link the link. Thank you. I wonder where they're calling from, Jennifer. Can we get some... Um... Um, some evidence of where people are calling from. Yes, you can put it in the chat where you're um, streaming us from. Thank you. Uh, will we be live? Yeah, we are live on Facebook, not on YouTube, but on Facebook. So you can check out our Facebook page and link the link. We have the UK. Welcome. Welcome, UK. Welcome. Wow. You guys are um, five hours ahead of us. So. Toronto, wow, yeah. 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 Wow. Welcome, Toronto. Mm. Welcome, link the link to your friends in the meantime. The UK again, all right. Yes, yeah, Sister Z, you've been with us from morning. Thank you so yeah. much for hanging out with us. New Jersey in the house. Right. Welcome, New Jersey. Okay. All right, then we'll, move on. we'll move on until um, the others uh, come on. So where are you calling from, Jennifer? Carlton? I'm in Richfield Springs, upstate New York. That's near um, Sarah Cruz or Albany. I'm one away from Albany. Okay. Somebody's calling from Virginia. Welcome, Virginia. I'm coming from um, the Great Bar of Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. I'm the Goshen Temple. Brooklyn here. De Deborah also joins. He's from Brooklyn. Wonderful. All right. Where are you calling from, Brother Carlton? I'm calling from North Haven, Connecticut. North Haven, Connecticut. Aldit Irving Dwarf. Uh, from the sunny state of Florida. I was just there last week. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Florida. Where are you streaming from, um, Brother Errol? I'm streaming from Queens, New York, Queens area, okay. New York City. Okay. Beautiful. So we are all over. We are international group. Mm -hmm. So guys, we really would, uh, we trust that we'll be able to finish this session, we've done two sessions already of how to keep the one you love, loving you forever. And we gave you six keys, five keys already. We have about maybe six more keys to share. We hope to finish it this evening. And Jennifer, you're wondering, is, is there any, any, anybody who was blessed by the previous sessions that we have? Please just open up and let us know or put it in the chat, let us know. What uh, you have learned? What resonate with you, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, while they're putting it in the chat, I, I want to challenge our audience today to help me find out what keys we have covered. So the challenge is help us. I, I'm probably going to give you a hint as to what keys we have covered. But if you can help me out, give me the key that we have covered. It's even more um, challenging if you give me, if it's key number one, tell me what that key was. Key number two, tell me what that key was. Number three, four, and number five. Today we're doing key number six. So if you can remember, I'll give you one of the keys. Is that fair, Brother uh, Graham? Should I give yes, it? It is. 
Yeah. All right. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So for those who wanted to know, key number one. Um, key number one, key number one, commitment to a lifelong marriage. You guys can see it on the screen there, right? Yes. Key number one on the side, commitment to a lifelong marriage. That's key number one. Let me let me see what the chat says. Is anyone putting out keys there? Um, let me see. Let me see. Not I'm looking. Not as yet. Are you scared? Am, am I? Am I? Is this challenge too too challenging? <laughs> yes, it's, it's too challenging. Oh, okay, so we got one. First one. I, I gave you guys the first one. All right. Uh, let's see. Key number. Key number two. What is key number two? Now I can hint it. it it's it's be blank and blank with each other. <laughs> Be blank and blank with each other. Let me see if anybody got it in chat. Okay, someone says communication. That sort of summarizes key number one. Um, no, no, the key communication was another key, I think. That, that's another key. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, that, that was yeah, another that key. Was so key, key number, number two. I'm going to throw key out, key number two. I like the answers there, and I think someone struck gold. Be honest and what? Yes. Open. open so yes. good job vera gill you got the honest deborah you got the honest that's great be honest but also be open with each other you could be honest with people only when they ask questions but being open <laughs> means that even before they ask about the question you know they, before they ask you about the background check you're gonna you're gonna they're gonna get the information from you instead of having to go digging digging for gold and they probably gonna find uh um what they're gonna find in the closet skeletons in the closet <laughs> all right so we're going to key number that's key number one two key number three key number three uh key number three can i give them some hints yes 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 um beware of and adjust your marital blank it's a one word. You have to beware of something and you have to adjust something. It's a mm. one word. You know how, ah, um, my oh my goodness. Good, oh my good. goodness. <laughs> good. Someone already got the answer there. Expectations, good. expectations. Right. That's it. Key number three, beware of and adjust your marital expectations. Expectations. The thing is, uh, when they implement it in their lives, the repetition, it it keeps with them so they'll know you know yeah. great great that's key number three so far we are key number three so we and did you know Errol, one... this, this, is a, this is a margin rich men seminar and it's nice if we can take a little note put it in your um, put in your notepad on your phone because uh we don't remember all of these things none of us uh, but we have to enhance our memories by you know by taking some notes by making notes so yeah. That's a challenge, Pastor. You're asking our audience now to go and get their notepad, get your pens, and when we start key number six, you need to be writing. Well, they could put writing. it in your cell phone, you know? Yeah, they could be typing, putting it in their phones. You know why? Because this week, someone is going to implement what we have covered. Oh, I like that. I As a like matter that. of fact, I'm thinking that you have already implemented something this week. Mm -hmm. So for those of you, has anyone implemented key number one, two, or three? Key number one, two, or three, and tell me what the feedback is. Someone yeah. says they're taking notes. Thank you, Sister Johnson. Taking notes. Deborah Johnson, taking notes. Good, good. So we have, we have, we have a student on board. Mm -hmm. Key number four. That was key number four, communication. Yeah. I know someone mentioned it earlier. Communication. That was Sean. Thank you, Sean. He mentioned communication. That's key number four. Key number four. And the, the last key that we covered last week is key number five. I wonder if anyone knows that. Mm. Anyone knows what key number five is? Be something. Be blank. Let me check mm. my let me check my chat. Key number five. What is key number five? Now, okay, yeah. I was gonna give them a hint. You think I should mm -hmm. give them a hint? Always. Key number five. 
You're making my class. They, I have to make them work hard for this thing. <laughs> they, they will appreciate it more, man. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> okay, it's an A word. It's an A word. So let me give you, I'll give you the A word. And the first person to give me the meaning of that word in the chat, that's the person I will acknowledge. So there you go. Key number five, be altruistic. Altruistic. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see who's giving me the meaning of that in the chat. Wait, wait for it. Wait for it. Somebody said to Someone giving. says giving. giving, giving. That comes close. Yes, very close. That comes close, giving. I could be generous. I could be generous. So key number five, as it says there, look out for the interests of your of your spouse. spouse. Put spouse. them first. Sure. Yes, I, uh, that one was so important. You know, um, most of the time I'm in a relationship, we, we, we're trying to see what we can get rather than what we can give. We're trying to be happy rather than see if we can help the other ones be a little bit happier. But but this uh, this principle of altruism is very important. It puts self last and, and the other person first, which is not an easy thing for most people to do. There are many questions. Do you remember how long we had to discuss that? Yeah, that was definitely suppose somebody yeah, can, one. So suppose somebody missed the, the first two sessions. How can they access it if they want? Okay, we did it. We did record the previous session, and um, we're going to make it so that we have the recording available for you. It was streamed on Facebook, but we have the recording separate. If you would like to get it, please contact the um, team, Healing of the Nation team. You know, our I'm going to put that there. That's our contact ways of giving telephone number 646 400 5720. Contact them. We will try to make it possible for you to get it, but contact us. That's the first step. And like I was saying here, Pastor, it takes a lot of self-sacrifice to I'm implement you. number five. Yes, yes. So, You're so that is, yeah, that's our recap now. And uh, we want to jump to number six. Uh, remember now, if you're just coming on, we're talking about how to keep the one you love loving you forever. Because one in two marriages end in divorce. And we realize that the first marriage does two. The second marriage about 60% end in divorce. And the third marriage about 70% uh, end in divorce. So it's a big issue. Uh, nobody, I don't know anybody who got married and wanted to uh, divorce. And when they get married, they had that as their goal. If those, I don't know them. No, there's, a hand don't up there, there's a hand up there, Gene Simmons. Okay, Simmons, um, please unmute. Go ahead. Sorry. Welcome. Go ahead, Miss Simmons. You can you can speak. Now I'm going to share the screen a bit larger so everyone can uh, see what is happening on the presentation. So our key number six, key number six for today is be a part of the love triangle. Pastor, be, that sounds a bit fishy. What's going on there? Be a part of the love triangle. I know. <laughs> is, there, is there a third partner who should be between the husband and the wife or what? Pastor, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I, 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 <laughs> you're, 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 something is wrong there, Pastor. You need to help us. Oh, we need to help you. All right. What, We're telling you to do something that, uh, that sounds fishy, but what do we mean? There's a text in Psalm 127, verse 1. What does it say? There you go. Uh, the next slide, dear. Slide, next slide. Yes, putting that, putting that up right It said, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord build the house, mm -hmm. they labor in vain who build it. We're building a whole house or we're building a home. We need more than ourselves. So the third party is uh, is who here, everybody? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord, right. Amen. You know, it was that way from the beginning, too. You must remember, uh, remember now, who was it that gave marriage to, to, to mankind? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord gave marriage to mankind Amen. because what? 
it was the Lord who brought Eve to Adam. Right. So in this relationship, we have, as it were, Adam and Eve, our husband and wife, at the base of the triangle. And then we have God at the top of the triangle. Each one will be connected to God. And from the connection to God, they will draw love, they will draw wisdom, they'll draw peace, and then you will come into the relationship. That's so beautiful, Troyango. Mm -hmm. You have a picture of it there, Ara? Yeah, I think there's a picture here. Let oh, me... but I'm not seeing it, and uh, I, I, I can't see it from where I am. Oh, yes. yes. You guys, I hope you guys can see it. I there. can see that now. Go down, yeah. Yes. So that's the right. triangle right there. Right. So you see, see it right there now. The Lord is in that triangle. Do you think, guys, that there are many marriages today who don't have uh, that third part in the relationship? Yes. Mm. I think I think that um, a lot of marriages suppose that the this third person is present, or <laughs> they um, they have they have in intended to have this third person present but mm -hmm. the intention and what actually happens is night and day mm. for some people um that third person happens to be a a, a family member okay. <laughs> and mm. maybe maybe not not the person the third person that should be there which is christ but in this case this love triangle makes sense i could see us starting from the bottom of the triangle where we are in a relationship, the three of us. And going mm -hmm. together, going together. One is not um, a middle and the next one is still at the bottom. Correct. They go together. How this triangle is faced, I can see the top of the triangle has only one person holds that top position. And that person is Christ. It's not the other two partners. Yeah. It's Christ at the top. And that means that if anybody else takes that top position, this triangle is not going to work. Right. So, so from a Christian point of view, we call it a covenant. It's an agreement between um, the human partners and God. Now, some people see marriage as just a social contract. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a thing that comes from the state alone. And if they see it that way, then um, they are limiting the power of the relationship. Because you see, if you remember, when God created Adam and Eve, both of them were in a right relationship with God, but there was an enemy. There was an enemy named Satan, and he was the one who created the issues. We are no match for the enemy. That's why we need someone who is bigger and greater than the enemy, and that's God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well. Um... We need someone bigger in the uh, equation, but I think that even if that person is present, we still need to make the choice. We still need to choose at all times to have that person. They can't go on vacation, right? Mm -hmm, no. Because if, if they go on vacation, then they're not actually present with us when we need them most. And um, this love triangle takes effort to build yeah and to our, to, to our young people here who are not yet married and you guys just um get caught up with the flesh uh mm -hmm. with the worldly things or with just the idea of being married we want you to think seriously about putting god in your relationship but carlton and jennifer how does that happen well, how can we get god in there? we talk about that but uh, what does that really mean how do we get him in there? If you look at the story of Genesis and God, who did he make for? He made the world, and then he made Adam. So Adam had time to stay alone with God. Then once God, Adam realized when he counted the animals, he said, wait a minute, everybody has a mate. Then God says, okay, let me put you to sleep. Made a woman. That woman had time to spend alone with God. And then when they both had time to spend alone with God, what did he do? Brought them together. Yes. So when you spend time alone with God, you get to know him personally and as individuals, then you can a couple relationship 
with that relationship together, you, have, you both have your individual, but it's, when you come to couple, you can both share in that love with Jesus also. Mm -hmm. Great. I think that's a great point, Pastor, because um, before you were married, you had time alone with God. It was a line, <laughs> but now you're married, so that it's a triangle now. It's no longer a line. God above and the two partners side by side beneath that triangle. Gradually, they're getting closer. Is it possible to get closer to your partner without getting closer to God? Yes. Is it possible? It is possible. Mm -hmm. And that's when they're going to leave Christ out of the picture. Mm -hmm. Because they don't, um, that this shows that they're not having family worship. They're not, you know, praying together. They're not asking for gu godly guidance and so forth. So that's mm -hmm. when now they are really handling the situation on their own strength and not having God in the middle of their union. What if, yes, what if some, and, what if? And Jennifer, um, you mentioned three things now. Evidences that God, that we really put in God first in the relationship is that we're gonna to have to spend time in prayer. Amen. They, they all go and say the family that prays together, stays together. stays together. Some people are so busy. We get up in the morning, get rushed out to go to work or go to school and forget that when we put God first, he will make things happen. So we have a little devotion, even 10, 15 minutes devotion. We pray and uh, we praise God. We give him thanks and we sing and we read the scripture. These are evidences that um, God should be in the relationship. I think that's very well right now. We could move to point number seven, uh, key number seven. Uh, in this relationship, guys. So go down a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. yes. move, move on, move on about four mm -hmm. slides down. So. Okay, key number seven. So yeah. I think, I think uh, we're moving down to key number seven there. Can we cover these already, right? That's the, there you go, key number seven. Key number Understanding seven is... your spouse. Yes, and uh, you know, you know, Peter was saying, Peter said, I think Peter 3, verse 5, verse 7, said, you must live with your spouse in an understanding manner. I don't know if, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very important point. But, but, but what does that mean? To understand, that would, that seems is something that would be very normal for everybody. Understanding your spouse. What does that mean? It may because, um, like, if anyone read the um the long the book the love languages, uh, you have to know your spouse love language. You have to know what pleases your spouse, what the pro what your spouse like from dislike. All of these things you have to, do so that you can be able to please your spouse. Mm -hmm. You know, and not um, just take things as is, because the more you you please and satisfy your spouse, is the more that love will kindle and stay kindle in that relationship. Yes, um, thank you. If you're anybody, a, anybody else, what, what, what does it mean to understand your spouse? Well, I think that um, for you to fully understand your spouse, you need to see them through the eyes of um, their peers as well as seeing them through their own eyes. How do they think about themselves? If you can tap into that, you will understand a lot about the person, how they think how they feel, what what makes them cry, what makes them happy, um, what um, what what are their experiences? See through their eyes. See the world through your the eyes of your spouse. That I think, in my understanding, that would help you to understand another person because you're always observing them from a second uh, point of view, from your own point of view, and as much about how they think, you may not understand. Oh, Can we get some views from the audience? Very, you guys made two very important points. You need to understand their love languages. Mm -hmm. Jennifer made that. And then um, Errol said we need to um, see them through their own eyes or put yourself in own, their own places. Man, I'm telling you, those are two powerful things you guys have made. For example, you know, uh, a man and a woman could be living for many, many years. And all of a sudden, one of them burnt up. But you don't love me. But mm -hmm. how do you love me? Look what I'm doing for you. <laughs> yeah, the hand raised too, Pastor. 
huh? has her hand raised. Yeah, hand raised. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Margaret. Go ahead, Sister okay. Margaret. Yes, thank you. It was saying I couldn't unmute. Um, thank you. Yes, what I was thinking was communication. Um, I, I think that the book is very valuable, The Love Languages. Um, but I, I, I think about our grandparents and great grandparents, and I wonder what did they do without that book? <laughs> and, um, and I'm thinking that um, that communication, actually listening to the person, uh, the fact that they, that back then they ate together at mm -hmm. a common table, um, I think that there was opportunity for communication. And in communicating, we know what the person thinks um, and what they like and what they don't like. Yeah. What do you guys mm -hmm. think? Thank you very much. Uh, even, even in nonverbal communication, spoken as well as nonverbal, that's a very important point also. You know, I don't know if I told this story, I remember about the same thing that we're talking about. Um, I, one of my you know, most affluent members in my church, when I was just starting ministry, I didn't know much about these things. And I was so elated when I went to her home. She has the latest furnishings, her car was there. Her husband was a businessman. And I said, man, you, you are blessed, look what you have here. And she just hissed her teeth and said, well, well, what's the purpose of me having all these things, but I don't have the man. Right. You see, the man was out working a lot to provide material things for the wife, but that's, that was her main need. Uh, you know, she wanted her wife, uh, her husband, to spend some quality time with her. And we're talking about the love languages again. And um, but he wasn't doing that because he didn't understand that the way she wants to be loved is for him to spend some time with her. And uh, so that's why uh, Jennifer, when you brought that up, I just think it that way. So many yeah. people are living together, mm -hmm. nice people. They're hurting one another. It's not because they are bad, but it's because they don't understand how to love the other person the way, in a way that the person feels as if he or she is loved. They tend to love the person in their own way. Yeah, and, and they, they, tend to, and, they tend to figure that if they give the person all the material things that they need, a car, a house, everything, and not being there, just providing that's all the person needs. And, and it's not, it's not. But that, that, that love that you're talking about, that love is just through the eyes of one partner. And they probably didn't look, they put themselves in their partner's shoes to see how they feel about it. They probably think, this is not what they really want. Someone placed in the chat, Deborah says, ask questions. If you want yeah. to know what your spouse thinks, ask, actually ask the question. What would you like for your birthday? Right, Pastor? Yeah, I agree, you know. Um, but some ladies like it to surprise them. Men tend not to like it so much. <laughs> but ladies tend to like it to surprise them. So some of them will be shocked uh, if you don't know what they should need, you know. But sometimes, ladies, you have to really uh, help, 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 help the guy understand what your needs are. And, and Pastor, I was just going to say that some men don't know how to understand a spouse mm -hmm. because they've never been taught that in their, in their upbringing from their parents. They've been taught to just give and be a provider, but not to be the emotional side of the relationship. So... Maybe some lady, like you said, you have to ask their husbands, you know, there's some things that I like. You know, even to play a game. Let's play a game. Yeah. You know, here's a list. There's some things I like, there's some things you like. Let's play a game. That would open him up to getting to understand what you like. He, let me tell you something. He won't be mad if he's a real husband. He would say, thank you, honey. I did not know that you like those things. I like the same things you like. That can bring a healthy relationship in stand as into the marriage instead of going, oh, you didn't know I like this, you didn't know I like that. You need to be loving and kind because some of us don't understand how to treat your spouse. Yeah, so that's why we have to, as Errol said, we have to kind of get into that person's skill, skin. Mm -hmm. Another another thing in understanding your spouse is, is to understand in your 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 spouse's family tree as much as you can, you know. Right. 
For example, if you're going to a family of men who don't talk, you have some men who they seldom talk, and you married one of those guys and you love to talk and everything, and you try to get them talk all the while, that may be a very tall order. Yes. You understand what I'm talking about, Carlton? That's me, because I don't like to, I, I'm a talker, but there's sometimes I like to be quiet. And uh, when my wife, and she like to talk, but I was like, I have nothing to say. <laughs> I just like to have nothing to say. And that frustrated her. So I know what you're talking about, that. Yeah, so your home of origin influence uh, the way. So, so sometimes it's funny, you know, you're married to one person, but you don't know that you're married to their background too. Because their background subs um, um, drives them. That's so, true. So keep that in mind. That's true. I think um, it, it's, sum it's summarized by that last quote on the slide there that says, seek, to, seek first to understand and then to be understood. Seek first to understand then to be understood. Yes. But I, I, that first. came from Stephen Covey. I think in his book, The Seven Habits of highly effective family or something like that. I think everybody should read that book. It's a very powerful book and it's filled with stories. So we, we, we have definitely been able to cover that key and yes. that's the key number eight. Mm -hmm. This is a big one, Pastor. How are we <laughs> gonna resolve this? Resolve conflicts quickly. Yep. Resolve conflicts quickly. And but don't that, let the sun go think, down on your anger. On your anger. I think men can resolve conflicts quickly. Am I right, Brother Graham? It depends. I, I always have to be honest. It depends on the man. Some men are stubborn. They don't want to. They don't want to say, you know what? I'm sticking with what I believe in. That's it. I'm not saying no more. <laughs> I'm being honest. As you said, how quickly would that be resolved? And um, it should be resolved rightfully before the next day. I could lose my life the same day and um my spouse by god's grace will be unhappy they're probably mm -hmm. they're stuck blaming themselves that they have lost their loved one and they didn't have a chance to apologize or to resolve that conflict and it helps to heal heal the relationship too mm -hmm. some people but, haven't know, spoken yes pastor but you know Errol, uh, that's an easy thing to do you know but some people, when they are deeply hurt, they, they don't want to hear about uh, resolving the conflict quickly, you know? They don't want it to be resolved. I, I guess um, I guess that would be an experiential thing. It's a Some, lot that I can't say about it. Somebody in the last, in the last session, we had, they said, after four days. <laughs> after four days? <laughs> if I get a heart attack on day number three. <laughs> I'm not going to make it to day number four. Yeah, I, I'm not talking about the reality of that. I'm not talking about the reality. We know the seriousness of not resolving a uh, sure. conflict quickly. You know, that's the idea, but but people have conflicts going on for not only days, but weeks and years. Yes. But am, am I speaking the truth? That is true. That is definitely true. I think a lot of persons do not resolve to solve the problem or do not resolve to resolve the problem. They have not decided that they want to resolve the problem, even though the solution could be in front of them or it could be there, it's reachable, but they have not decided in their heart that this is what they want to do. So the conflict remains it could be a small conflict. It could be a butterfly and a moth conflict, but they have not decided that they actually want to fix the problem. And so it actually remains as a problem and it festers. So why would they decide? Why would they not want to fix the problem? That's a good question. Why Why would that be? I think the audience, their answers in the audience, and people can tell yes. us, yes, why would you want to fix a problem? Let me hear what they're thinking out there. A number of reasons. People can come up with reasons why they don't want to fix the problem. Well, Because some people are resistant to change. Like Brother Graham says, men don't want change. Even though they know the problem could be fixed, they don't want anyone bossing them around probably or telling them what to do. Even if they tell them in a nice way, some men are just resisting 
change. So they don't yeah. want to solve the problem. Some people want revenge. Yeah. Some people want revenge. That's a big word. <laughs> That's a big word. Um, some yes, yeah, some people don't know how to express themselves. For the Graham, somebody just spoke my thoughts right there. there Sister wow. Johnson says that some people don't know how to express themselves. So the words don't come out. And uh, because the words don't come out, that struggle builds tension. Yeah. It builds tension in the person who needs expression but can't. And it builds tension in the relationship that is being ripped apart because an unresolved issue still exists. And um, some don't know how to apologize. Somebody said most people do not want to say I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, but but I, I have an issue with this one, and this is purposely I have an issue with that one. Most people don't know how to say sorry. So so I guess if they can't say sorry to me, I should at least go up to them yeah. and tell them that I want the relationship to survive. Right. Don't wait for them to tell you sorry before you fix the problem. If your brother has offended you, don't wait for him to come to you, go to him, go to the brother who is not speaking and help him to express, ask him the questions. Sister Johnson said, ask questions, I think. Ask the questions out there and let give him room to express himself. Maybe he like doesn't know problem. the right questions, yeah. Give him room because you know, men and women deal with problems differently, you know. Uh, some men can get very angry and, and, and they can abuse you, you know, in trying to resolve those issues. Um, some men just want you to leave them alone, let them go in their cave. As um, this guy who wrote the book from um, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. Mm -hmm. Women like to talk to solve their problems, but men prefer going in their caves. And, um, and, if you, and if the women bother them too much before they're ready, you can even make things get worse. I don't know if anybody understand that, you know? I think um, it's placed here and it says, identify the source of the problem, step mm -hmm. number one, and um, recognize that both parties have different temperaments, male okay. and female, we differ. And then um, you have to look at your background also, the way you're brought up and the way your spouse was brought up and then try to resolve the conflict considering all of these factors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why right. it goes back to the one we talk about, you should understand your mate. Yes. So if you understand your mate, you can know how they deal with um, conflicts and issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's a very, 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 what are some, what are some um, conflicts that couple normally have? Um, just ask the audience there. What are some conflicts that couples normally have? Um, someone says here, I, I'm not sure what question they're asked, answering here, but some people are um, struggling to express themselves, as mm -hmm. said, um, Sister Deborah says, some people don't know how to express themselves. And to, to resolve the conflict, they look for outside solutions or they just, they just put it in the back of their mind. They bury the problem without solving it. They bury the, the head of the ax and they left the handle sticking out. Cool. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, I remember one of my family life sugar instructor gave us, and I never forgot that. He said, issues buried alive never die. Right. Issues buried alive never die. That's right. Because you know what happened? If you're carrying that issue with you, sometimes something may happen that just trigger you up and you lose it because you didn't resolve it. Or if you keep it up too long in your heart, it could influence your blood pressure, your diabetes, and you name it. So issues buried alive never die. That's right. So we're to try to resolve the issues. If you can't do it here, and you have a good pastoral counselor, you have a counselor, nothing is wrong with you going. For these places, depending on the type of issue, to get some resolution to the issue. Some Christian people just think all we're going to do is pray, oh. and prayer is very good. Yes. But sometimes the Bible said, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Um, the the um, 
I see I see Deborah posed a question here, but I don't think this is an issue that could be glossed over because so many people have to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. They're they're solving their problems at work, they're solving their problems probably with their friends, but when it comes to their family issues, they have they're stuck. Pastor, help us out. They're stuck at home. <laughs> Is the, is the platform quiet or, no, or did I, I mute to, myself? To be honest, uh, ladies, I'm going to give you some signs when it's time to leave your man alone and talk to him. <laughs> Go on, sir. If you see when a man does that, give him his space because he's going to hit you. <laughs> and I'm not joking. <laughs> Even a Christian man. When you just keep coming at a man constantly and he's telling you, please stay out my face. Give me time out. And I know ladies know what I'm talking about. If it happened to them or you know somebody that happened to them or you see it in the street, the man is saying, just please give me some time to think about this. But if you keep coming and coming, if he start doing this, just don't, don't come near him because it's very serious. He, he's going to accidentally slap you and say, listen, I, I, that's I, an, a, that wouldn't be accidental at all. It's, it's the truth. <laughs> Some say, they say it was an accident. They're going to tell you it's an accident, but that's a, it's a reaction. That's a calamity, brother. Graham. Exactly. That's an exactly. A calamity. exactly. But I, he should to, walk, mm -hmm. but he can walk away. That means he can control himself. He, he is walking he has, away, but they keep coming at him. And mm -hmm. ladies, what I'm talking about, because this is very serious. You want that conflict resolved? Give him his space. And also when the, men, when the women are telling you, hey, give me some time. Let me figure this out. But if you keep calling, honey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She said, I don't want to hear it. We'll talk about it later. You got to give her her space because she's going to, there's a TV show they call, That's When They Snap. And they always talk about some when they snap and they kill the person. We have to learn that we're dealing with human beings who have simple fallen nature, even though we're in Christian marriages. But when the conflict is too overbearing, and you keep bringing it up and bringing it up, someone is going to get hurt. We have to learn to give ourselves space, as Jesus did to us, go into a quiet place for a while. This is very important for this conflict to, to be resolved because many of us have been injured, hurt, said um, terrible things to one another, and we can't take it back. The passion of the moment, right? Yes, amen. Deborah asks, how crime. much? Deborah mm -hmm. asks in the chat here, she's asking, how much room should a person be given? Uh, if we're supposed to resolve issues before we go to bed, how much room? I I would propose that you give them the whole house because if you <laughs> give them the whole house, they'll have enough room to solve the problem before bed. But what do you think? Let me hear your views. Yeah, I want to go back to what Todd mentioned. You know, one thing that we have to be guard um, guarded about on this program is remember we're dealing with the real and the ideal. That's right. We tend to be idealistic. Uh, about how things, should, this is the way it should be, but this is not the way it, tend, it is. We have to deal with the way it is until we get it to the way it should be. Amen. You know, uh, and that's very important. So what Carlton was saying is that something that we should just brush over lightly. Uh, so some, people, be, it, some people have a shorter fuse than others, than others. So again, you have to understand your spouse. That's what we're talking amen. about. Amen. Some uh, amount and, of care and care and concern uh, needs to be considered. You need to approach it carefully, right? In order for it to be successful. V Vera says, um, you must give both time and space okay. for like resolution that. of yes. issues, time yeah. and space. That was a good, good, that was a good counsel, time and space. And guess what, guys? Remember that as Christian people, um, the Holy Spirit is here to help us. We want to solve the problem to ourselves at our own time. Mm -hmm. But then we can uh, uh, we, we, we can pray because if you have been preaching to him all for, for 10, 15 years and nothing has happened, maybe you just have to back up. That's, That's back true. off and, um, and, and talk to God about it and see what would happen. If you keep on doing the same old, same old, you get the same old, same old. So what's plan B? What's plan B? You, you back up, but the problem still exists and you want solutions. Isn't, you there, isn't it possible? Some problems you're yeah. going to have to live with. When you get married, you're going to realize 
And any and any honest married person at MMC, the married person on this line will tell you that there are some problems you're going to have to live with. That's true. And you have to decide which one you can live with or you cannot live with. Now, if somebody's cheating on you, I'm not saying you should live with that, right? No. It's your decision. But they, not all the problems are going to be solved the way that you um, want them to be solved. You have to live with them. What does this sir, this serenity prayer say again? Um, anybody remembers it? The serenity prayer. We have to learn to accept those things that we can't change. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah. Uh, it, it change just, the it, things so. we can. Huh? Yes. Accept the things we can and um, what? Change those that we can and, and uh, what we can't do, Lord, will give us a difference to do that. I can tell you that in marriage, beloved, there are certain things because it's a person's temperament, the person's personality. It may be upsetting you. It's not going to change. You have to decide whether or not you want to live with that. I wonder what my audience says about that. Those of you who are married, is that true? Um, someone, okay, okay, I'll, I'll allow them. If, if they want to speak, they should raise their hands. We're going to unmute them, but I'll allow them to unmute at this point. The serenity prayer said, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Wisdom yeah. to know the Amen. difference. Amen. That was fast, Jennifer. Read a little bit slower. <laughs> <laughs> the serenity prayer says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, mm -hmm. the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right. I think I think there's another wisdom that you can accept in that prayer. Pastor, can I add it? Whatever you want. The, wisdom, the, the, the wisdom to know that with God all things are possible. Sure. <laughs> some, some things I can't change and I have to accept that, powerless though I be. But when we place it, when we place prayer, some people have been praying for years for their husbands or wives or spouses to come to Christ. And then it happened in one day. Everything started, the domino effect started, and that spouse accepted Christ. Problem solved one day, but it had to have a years of work just to accomplish a solution. Yes, and right. on the other side, too, there are some people who are praying for their spouses to change rather than praying for them, for them God. to change their reactions <laughs> to the spouse. Yeah. Because right. if you always pray for your spouse to um, change, especially loudly in his presence, he's going to think that maybe you don't accept him the way he is. You know, something wrong with him. That's right. <laughs> and, and when people feel bad in that relationship, wow, they, they can but be an attitude. But I'm, I'm just finding a bad behavior, but I'm just telling you um, <laughs> uh, some of the outcome of what, of what we're praying for. And then Sister Johnson says that's why um, that's why it's important to make time, to take time to know that person before you marry them. So lives. true, so true. Boy, that you can't. Um, I'm telling can't you. turn back the clock, right? No, no, that's, you can't turn back the clock. Okay, you can't okay. overlook what he says. Many of us rush into this thing, like that's you right. know, desperation. Yeah. Can I jump in and say something go that, ahead, I, go ahead, that I agree and disagree? Oh, no, welcome, Dr. Ephraim. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping from one platform to the other. I had to finish up there. Yes. Um, can I say I agree and disagree? Sure. Yes, we will take time to know the person, but guess what? We will never know everything. There are some things you. that you're not going to learn until after the marriage, regardless yeah. of how much you get to know that person. But I can tell you this from my experience. I pray for changes within me. Yeah. And then the changes that I wanted came about. Mm -hmm. So I pray that God changed me, not mm -hmm. him, but changed me. Oh, that's um that's a big prayer. That's a well, super that's the prayer. prayer. That's a super prayer. Yeah. And as Ephraim says, after 19, 20 years, I'm still learning things about my wife that I didn't know before. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Have fun. Key number nine, Pastor. Key number nine. Yeah, going with that, yes. Um, key number nine. What, what, what key number nine says? Have fun, romantic getaways. You know, Amen. do not let your mouth get too boring. You know, the, the, the same old, same old 
every day you have to learn to spice up your marriage. You have to learn um, what makes your your your, your partner tick and um, I, 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 and create that environment for that to happen. Guys, we cannot be too boring, especially when you have a romantic woman in your life. They need fun. And uh, the way men um, have fun is different from the way women have fun too. You know that? It's true. Yeah. Hey, give me a tennis, give me a tennis rock and a ball, and I'll be on the court for two hours. <laughs> Ask me to watch a romantic movie. I'm I sleep within the first five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but my wife will watch a romantic movie. She loves those things, but those things are. You know, it's, I don't know, that's what she went is. And <laughs> you have to understand each other the way you have fun. But the marriage must have some fun in it, some laughter, some play. Anybody else, and anybody else can comment on that? Like you said, um, they must have fun together. I like point number three here where it says attend marriage enrichment seminars. Ooh, yeah. I hope that's fun for everybody, for the, the mm. whole family. But more importantly, for the marriage couple, I think after years of living together, a family, um, they think that they don't need counseling. After years, they think that they know more than what counseling can offer them. But from the outside perspective, their neighbors, their friends, their colleagues might see things about their relationship that obviously needs fixing and that cannot be fixed without counseling. And it strikes them with fear. It strikes the outsider with fear as to how to go up to my friend and their spouse and to tell them, you know what, go get counseling about this issue. Go get counseling about that issue. How, how does a marriage couple get counseling to enrich their relationship after they have known each other? For how many years, Pastor? Uh, 40 years. Okay. But you know, for marriage, marriage enrichment seminar, that word enrichment is very important. It's not because you have a bad marriage. No. You can make bad marriage better and mm -hmm. um, good marriage what? <laughs> so 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 it's 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 just it's just I remember when I came here for the first 17 years when Dr. Young was our family life educator. I every year I went to the marriage enrichment seminar and they have we had a pretty good relationship. But then I, I learn more, I meet with people, we interact with people. It's just like if you were a nurse or a teacher or a doctor, you know, uh, you're going to take some, um, some refreshers courses. Why don't you do that for your most important relationship, which is your marriage relationship? I'm just wondering the people in the congregation, how do you guys have fun? Do you have fun in your marriage? Do you have fun? How do you have fun? We'd really like to get some, uh, some feedback on that. If anybody on the panel can tell us, tell us, anybody in the, in the audience, tell us. Open your mic and tell us or write it in the chat. That's everyone is different. I have never been to a marriage enrichment seminar. The church offers them, but I've never attended them. For me, give me a trip any day. I just love traveling that as long as we travel, it's always something new and it's always something to spice up the relationship in terms of going someplace different, a different environment. That's all I need, a change of scenery. Um, that, that, that's a low demanding person, right? No, low, low upkeep. Brother, brother, brother Graham? I'm going to put it. Is good. Simplicity, simplicity is good. She's easily to be pleased sometimes. Some people want a dozen roses. She just want one. Wow. <laughs> and don't give me flower seed. I'm not a flowers person. Wow, that's even better, right? <laughs> just write words and I'm good. <laughs> right. That's right. The grill. Pastor is not saying anything. but uh, I wonder why this one is a hard one for the audience to answer. Um, because most of us don't know how to have fun. Um, as a couple uh, come on audience open yeah. your mic and speak, speak behind me is fun Amen. take me to a place with many beaches oh yeah and I'm that good. is fun <laughs> that sunlight I'm good mm -hmm. that's great I guess I guess culturally people haven't seen um, a fun uh, fixing a relationship a fun thing 
probably that what that's what they saw from their parents, how their parents' relationship went. They kind of mimic that relationship structure, or you know, culturally, it's never something they thought about. So it's not in their reference, their mental reference. So they're not thinking, okay, we're gonna have fun by going to a marriage counseling session or enrichment seminar, as they put it here. But I think simply going to the beach, okay, let me change the <laughs> venue, going to a resort or someplace, uh, going, on a, um, going on an outing with your family. Um, if you're in the rural areas, you could go down to the back of the forest or someplace quiet where you can spend quiet time. I think that is valuable for the relationship of the family and for bonding. It's very important. But those and, are just, yeah. And also the things that you did to get him or her, you have to continue to keep doing in the marriage. You know, we, we can't stop. Just now you got you got her. I say, okay, or oh, you got him. I don't have to take him to the beach. I don't have to take him to roller skating anymore. We don't have to go bike riding. We don't have to play tennis together no more. But this is something you have to continue to do if you two see love and like is two different things in a marriage. I learned that in marriage. I can love you, but if I don't like you, I won't spend time with you. Oh wow. See, that's yeah. what that's what is going on today. We love each other, but we don't like each other. It's not fun. <laughs> You're not fun. And, and yeah. so if, if I'm if I like to laugh and you call me silly, oh you're so silly, we don't do that. I'm like, wow. So you know what so, that so. that made me not to laugh around that person. Oh wow. So, and so I but, lost brother, me. hold on, brother Graham. I yes. I uh, my pen, my pen fell down somewhere. One second, I gotta get it. Someone said in the chat, Sister Vera Gill said, start courting again, which is true. Remember where you're coming from. Yes. Start courting again. There's someone who's in the chat, Jennifer, read them too. Yes, and then another person says, find something you both can laugh about even when there is tension. Amen. And someone said, don't stop dating and do fun games together, like laser tag, I don't know what that is, pick fruits together. That's right. That's yeah. right. Some, some people better call them, especially in the church, the marriage is just business, That's business. <laughs> No pleasure. No pleasure. No That's it. All work and no play. That's it. Yes. Jack, Jack a dull, a dull boy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and that is why, and that is why can, that can cause marriage to be in serious trouble because somebody is finding enjoyment somewhere else. Okay. Um, some somebody just uh, said something there. I hope I, I know that um somebody in the chat called to read it around in the chat. Yes, we have uh, a hand raised. Gil too. says Gil says in the chat, um that's deep. That's deep. But brother, what Brother Carlton said was deep, yes. But the like and, and the love situation. Had she has the like and the love. Oh, open. okay. Go ahead. I'll let her say it. Go ahead, Sister Gil. You can speak. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Good afternoon, Good afternoon. sister. What, what I heard interesting today, unfortunately, when um, Ivana Trump died, um, they had played back a previous interview with her and they were saying, how did you even stay friends with Donald after your divorce? He was so horrible. And you can tell that was a woman who really knew her husband. She said, oh, it, it, it was business for him and he can't lose. It. So it was okay that he dragged her and he did all that stuff because she knew who he was. So that was mm -hmm. interesting. And I remember she said a quote, so I never forget it. She said, don't get mad, get even. After the divorce, she said, never get mad with your spouse, get even. So she eat him where the, she eat him where the money is. So she she <laughs> had to be like him. She was mad. Yes. Him, so yeah. I remember that. She said, don't get mad, get even. So she eat him where the money is. So don't get mad at your spouse. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Gil, uh, Sister Gil. Just wanted to let everyone know that you know we 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 want to we want to acknowledge that there are issues in every marriage, but when you want to get when you want to have fun in your relationship, you have to find a way of putting aside all your problems, putting yeah. aside clock out on the problems and clock in on the on the joy of your experience. Go and have some fun time out. Forget right. about those worries so that you can recuperate 
Uh, let me share the screen again. I think. No, no, one more minute. I want to say something there. For some men, mm -hmm. to have fun is just to have sex with the wife. Mercy. Pastor, say that again. For <laughs> some men, to have fun means just is to have sex. But is is that is that completely so, um, Dr. Ibrahim? I don't think all men are built that way. <laughs> no, that's, no, I'm actually that's, not a that's not a definition of fun, but you are correct, Pastor, because there are some, some marriages that are built entirely on that. And there is no fun, there is no nothing else, because I have heard friends that complain that that is all that their husband thinks about and talks about, and there is nothing else there. Mm. Angela King has her hand up, Pastor. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, the men that pass the daily is referring to those are the one who never grew up. Just, oh, well, I, I, just I, I think they just, just boys trapped in a man's body and they mm -hmm. never grow up and that's all they know. And mm -hmm. also studies found that those men are very addicted to pornography. Yes. So mm -hmm. as a result, they don't know what reality is. So they constantly see themselves with someone else even when Amen. they're having intimate moments with their spouse to whom they're married mm -hmm. so they do have a problem but you know what's even more frightening it mm -hmm. is in the church i don't recall if i share this story with you guys but about two years ago right, right before the pandemic hit i attended virtually one of those um end it now session mm -hmm. and at the very beginning they asked a series of questions some of the questions were like, have you ever cheated on your spouse? Um, have you ever watched pornography? Have you ever thought about being with someone else when you're with your spouse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the bar, they have a bar that's scrolling, you know, to give you an idea how many people have responded to the given question. And when they ask the question, how many of you have watched pornography? The, when the bar went scrolling, and these are Seventh-day Adventists because they asked you at the beginning if you're Seventh-day Adventists, the bar just kept on running off the screen. And the fact of the matter is there are a lot, we have administrators, we have pastors, we have teachers, we have just the average church members. And the sad thing is, I really don't know if we have within our organizations, quote unquote, professionals who can help these people because it is a serious problem. And yes. here's an even bigger problem with that. You know, in the sports arena, when someone, a football player, basketball player has issues with whatever it is, they will bench them and make sure they get the counseling that they need before they put them back in the game. The problem is I'm seeing within our organization, they don't quote unquote bench them. They just let them move on or they just rotate them from church to church or state to state or conference. And as a result, we are going to see this problem. But you know what? I fear in the future that I see happening until a class action lawsuit hit our organization for such behavior, mm -hmm. only then they're going to take it seriously. But the sad thing is so many families would have been destroyed by then. So this is something that I think we just, you know, keep moving it around and it's not been dealt with, which I mean, for me, it's very frightening. And folks, I'm not speaking off the top of my head. I've worked with a lot of our young people. I know what I'm talking about. There's a molestation. There's so many things and it's not been dealt with. We have people within our organization who was raped within our churches. They got children as a result of it. It's still not dealt with, and they're hurting, and our organization is not dealing with it. I'm very sorry to say, but I, I guess um, I know passes on the line, but I would I would like to say from um, from the grassroots when you when you're looking when you're looking up to the top of the hill, it's hard to see exactly what's happening up there at the top of the hill when you're looking from the valley and you're looking up. So there are a lot of in a lot of ways we're not able to to see everything that's happening behind the scenes but we know from outside we see we see probably the results of what has already happened from years probably abuse happened from years and then you see the results now and you expect a quick fix to a problem that has been nesting for decades we should also exercise patience from our perspective where we're willing to work along with the system and people that are existing in clergy, because across all of the Christian di uh, diaspora, across all of the Christian denominations, 
this problem has been festering and it's now breaking out. It's now breaking out. So we need to exercise, of course, diligence to find the problem and to start to fix the problem. But we also need to exercise patience to make sure that when it's fixed, it's done properly and completely. But if we just sit back and uh, we get involved in, um, in probably taking sides and throwing stones, it only hurts more people and it creates a spirit of anger and explosive spirit that just causes more explosion. You know, Errol, we're going to have to start. Yeah. We, we need to put that idea on public cup with a, with, a, with a discussion on that. Correct. That's correct. a whole new issue. A whole we're new talking topic. about having fun together. We're talking about things that keep people living long together. And the point that we are now is, you know, we should have fun together. And we're talking about some people where sex is concerned. That's what they think fun is. But that may not be so. And then the pornography um, things come up right now. So that's another issue that we probably have to deal with another time. Yeah, correct, correct. That's, yeah, yeah, yes. So folks, um, you're here today, it's your marriage. Uh, you can look back or you can look in or you can look forward. I uh, hope fun, you have fun with your spouse. Uh, whatever fun, what does that mean? Do you need to have something now? It brings a little lightness, a little um, lubricant in the relationship when you learn to have fun, you laugh and play uh, together in the ways that are um, that are appropriate to each of you, right? All right, so that's number one. Number 10, remain sexually faithful to your spouse if you want to remain... Um, if you want to live long together, that should be that should be that should be that should be evident. Am I right? Mm -hmm. it, it should be very it, evident. But it should be evident, so. but it's not so no. in many cases. I see another hand again. Angela King is raising her hand. I I think she wants to respond. Yeah. The text yeah, okay, we can't no we problem. can't um, we can't overlook the text though. Verse 32 through to 30. Wait, let, 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 let's hear the, the, the partner. We like when the guys talk. Go ahead, Sister Go King. On, oh, that was an accidental raise hand. But now that you have me, I will speak. Praise so the here's the thing, brother um, technician. I don't know your name in the black suit. So here's the thing, though. You see, as a teacher, okay, one of the things that I find that bothers me in New York state, I don't know about other states, we are mandated reporter. In other words, you know, right after 9-11, they have a saying, if you see something, you must say something. When I go to a classroom or when I have a group of new students, I let them know I'm a licensed professional New York state teacher. And when you come to my classroom, I am the teacher. When I see something, I will say something. And in many other cases, I will have to write something and it becomes permanent and it becomes a permanent part of your record. I think it doesn't take a mandated reporter in our system, in our organization, in the seventh day organization, it should not. It takes a human being. So I think too often when some of us see things, we turn the blind eye or the deaf ear, but I'm telling you, I've created many enemies at my church, my former church, and maybe I will continue. Here's why. I have a thing whereby, you know, some people, they see something that, going to talk to the pastor and some pastors that, oh, well, I don't like to talk about, you know, talk to families about this. I'm not one of those. I have told them, I saw something at my church one day and I questioned it. And I said to the person, he was the head deacon. I said, let me tell you something. You see these two little kids that I, these two little girls that I've been to church. I said, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't like the way you hug them. I said, don't let me see you hugging them because the mom is an Adventist also. She's a member of the church, but she's a nurse. She works every Sabbath, so she doesn't come, but that's none of my business. I bring them to church, okay? And one day I saw him tickle them, and I went off on him. And I said to him, if I ever see you touch these kids again, I said, I'm not going to the pastor. I'm going to the police, and you need to get that in your head. And he responded, well, I don't know what's your problem because the mother doesn't mind. I said, cut your nonsense. I said, when they're with me, I am mommy. So I said, I'm telling you, if you touch them again and I see, I'm going straight to the police. I said, that's called grooming, my brother, and you don't do that. So he had the nerve to go back and tell the mother and the mother went off on him and said, have you lost your mind? I know her. 
when she's with them, she's right. Why am I telling you all of this? Too often, too many of us see things of, oh, we don't want to destroy families. Oh, we don't want to do this. We don't want to bring any disgrace on the church. Hogwash. You see Sister something, King, your duty um, that's, an, that's a very important issue, but that, you know, that, that, that needs another, another different session to discuss that. Mm -hmm. You know, sexual abuse is a big issue, but this, uh, no, this, this little forum is not what we're, we're talking about, whether it's concerned. So if you don't mind, we could, we could come up with another session with that, rather than discussing, like, we're talking about what we want to talk about. So um, we, we want to come off that issue and just finish this uh, program. We have a pastor. We're breaking up, Pastor. We're losing uh, you. Huh? We're losing you. We're yeah, not hearing you. Yes. I okay, don't know um, what you're not hearing. You. Well, we're hearing you better now. Yes, I'm saying that the issue of um, a reporting, mandatory reporting on sexual abuse is kind of different from what we're talking about this evening. Yeah. So we have to come up with another session for something like that. We're talking about how to keep the one you love loving you forever. We have mentioned nine stuff already. We are on the 10 one, which is to remain sexually faithful to your spouse. And we were saying that that should be something very, very um, simple for people to understand, but it's not as simple as it may seem when you're not out. You know, um, most, most, um, most couples cannot survive unfaithfulness, sexual unfaithfulness in mind. Could you read the text that's there for us, Proverbs 6, 32 to 35? It says, but whoso committed adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that do it, it destroys his own soul. Verse 33, a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Verse 34, for jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. <laughs> That's what the man who had 700 wives and 300 concubines tells us about adultery. Solomon. Mm -hmm. Because he learned his lesson. <laughs> Do you think people can survive? Um, um, a marriage can survive adultery, sister Dr. Ephraim. With God, all things are possible. So, That's a, so it's humanly impossible, right? But with God, all yeah. things are possible because I have actually seen where a woman forgave her husband, and the marriage continued, and he never made that mistake again. So. Wow. I cannot just sit back and say, if a person do this, that a person should just, you know, leave their marriage because everyone is different and circumstances are different. So there are some individuals that can handle it. You know, God never give us more than we can bear. <laughs> there are some that would be able to handle it and can deal with it, you know, and I tip my hats to those individuals, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because it's only God. And that, that's why I'm saying, you know, it's only God that could make that possible. So, wow. and sometimes when it's discussed and they see what can lead up to that, um, you know, that adultery, understanding with the, with the proper counseling, they can, um, they can survive. They can really yes. survive. And that's going to take some time, you know, because mm -hmm. trust has been broken. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's going to take time to repair that. It's not an easy thing. So the best advice is don't go there. Amen. If you have gone there, no, you play know with you're fire. Time and grace, huh? Don't play with fire. No. You know, I, I really have to mention this one because it was the infamous one in the whole country with Bill Clinton. And why I go there is because I was listening to an interview with um, uh, Pastor Fripps. And he, when he saw that, they, they had a, a bond together. And when he saw what happened, he said he wrote him and tell him to read. I forgot which Psalms. And he did read it. And after he read the Psalms and everything, that's when he came out publicly and said that he's, he has been sinned and whatever and stuff. It's a Psalm so I, 51. Yeah, I, I forget. Yeah, something like that. But I really, as I said, 
to tell you the truth, I really admire um, the woman because some women would have been destroyed because of the public figure that they're in. But as I said, when you're invested in a relationship, you know, you can't just, I mean, it's hurt and whatever, and it's going to take time. But when you're invested and you love a person for so many decades, you know, you can find forgiveness. You can. You All right. So times, you can. You can. So, well, so so a word to the wise is sufficient. We're going to go to the next key, Errol, because we have to wrap this up now. Actually, we, we're, um, we're slowly wrapping up. Um, the 11 is, key is what? Make one's right. Make one's right. Learn to forgive. That's very important. Learn. Because all of us are sinful beings, erring beings to err is human. And uh, we have no perfect relationship. So we have said, we have um, shared 11 keys for you to stay together in love forever. We have one last one. We want to. Um, just wrap that with, with, with that one now. What does the last one say? Uh, the master key, key number, key number 12. Mm -hmm. That's the master key, key number 12. Mm -hmm. Invite God's Holy Spirit to preside mm -hmm. over your marriage. That should be. Um, Correct. We must have the spirit of God or we can never have harmony in the home. It's in red. So let me read it again, Pastor. We must have the spirit of God or we can never have harmony in the home. The wife, if she has the spirit of Christ, will be careful of her words. She will control her spirit. She will be submissive. And yet, will not feel that she is a bond slave, but a companion to her husband. It doesn't end there. Let me continue. If the husband is a servant of God, he will not lord it over his wife. He will not be arbitrary and exacting. We cannot cherish home affection with too much care. For the home, if the spirit of the Lord dwells there, is a type of heaven. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Yes. For the home, mm. if the spirit of the Lord dwells there, it's a type of heaven. So this is a missing ingredient in many Christian homes. The presiding of the spirit of God over home persons and affairs. And we may have the latest um, iPad, iPhone, television, furnishings, car, the highest um, educational achievements. But none of these things guarantee any uh, harmony in the home. Mm. We need the spirit of the living God. Because when the spirit is in there, he brings the fruit of the spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace. You just name it, all those nine satisfying qualities. So, mm -hmm. so, so my appeal to us this evening is to ask that the Spirit of God will come in our lives and come in our homes. As we said before, except the Lord builds the home, they labor in vain that builds it. So, beloved, search your heart, search your soul, search your home, uh, search your relationship, and see if you, have our, you are allowing the Spirit of God to preside over it. And the Bible says in Isaiah 4, 4, 3 and 4, if I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. That's what will happen uh, when the Lord is in your home and is in the life of your children. That's beautiful. I just love that. And um, in Luke mm -hmm. eleven thirteen, the Bible says, if you then be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him? So you see, God is eager and God is willing to give his most precious gift to all of you, beloved. All of us, beloved. Just as parents, we are eager to give gift to our children. But we have to recognize our need for that. We have been trying to raise our, our, our marry our family without the Spirit's help. Now we realize that we can't raise it without, him, without um, the help of the Spirit. 
So as we bring this session to its close, are you willing to ask the Holy Spirit to um, come in your life afresh and new and ask him to give you a new home, a spirit-filled home, a heavenly home here on earth? That's what God desires. And Amen. the Spirit will help you to ward off all what the devil is trying to do. Dr. Ephraim, can you just pray to um, close off the session? Okay, let us pray. Dear most kind and holy God, we thank you, dear Father, for this presentation here today, Lord. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be poured out upon each of us, dear Lord. Father, we pray that you will be the center of all marriages mm -hmm. represented here today, dear Lord. Father, help us to put everything in your hands and let you be the center of our lives. And Father, if there are those who are seeking to become married, dear Lord, Father, let them do so through you and let them not do the choosing for themselves, but to ask you to choose for them. Because Father, when you're in it all, as we can see all the keys represented here, that if you are the center, that is how we can have that heaven on earth in our homes and in our marriages. So Father, I pray that the takeaway will be that each one of us will ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon our household, in our marriages, upon our children, even upon our friends and neighbors and our enemies as well, dear Lord. Because Father, if we love our enemies, we can help to draw them to you as well. So, Father, I pray that each one of us will lift you up because you said, if you be lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. So, Father, continue to be with each and every one of us. Continue to bless us all. And, Father, if there is anyone who needs to have a walk with you and to choose you today, let that person reach out to us, dear Lord. Or if there is anyone who believes that they need Bible studies or to be baptized and to make that decision to follow you, Father, I pray that that person will reach out and that they will raise their hands and ask for whether it be prayer, whether it be baptism, whatever the need is there, Lord. Because, Lord, let us all continue to follow your example. As our Savior, you mingled with men and you meet their needs and then you bade them to follow you. So, Father, we pray that these programs will not only enlighten, but that they will transform lives to come to know you as Lord and King. This is my prayer in your, is in your most holy, worthy, precious name. Amen and amen. 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 We're not hearing you again, Pastor. Oh, I was wondering if it's me. <laughs> no, he's, no, he's tripping. I don't know. Are you hearing me now? Yes, now. I'm just thanking all, thanking the panel for coming on and all our audience for coming on. And God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. If you're in Brooklyn, you're going right now to the evangelistic outreach and visit us between uh, Beverly and Tommy. Back to you, um, guys. Have a great evening. Thank you, Pastor. Have a blessed evening, everyone, blessed and everyone. a safe week. Yes. Stay yeah. blessed. If there is anyone that needs prayer, anyone that needs Bible study or wants to be baptized, you can meet with us. Just raise your hands mm -hmm. and your virtual hand, your physical hand, whichever hand, and <laughs> we will meet with you and pray with you. Thank you and have a blessed week. Amen. 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 Mm-hmm.